in our beginnings, we were, after all, in the midst of the 60s ferment. And one of the things that was in that ferment was that every institution was being looked at to see whether it was successful in what it said it was out to do. The East started fertilizing the West more. It always is in, in phases, but it became prominent, especially with the Beatles. You know? <laughs> right? We all got very fascinated by what the East had to teach the West. A lot of the people who were influenced by Asian religions and who um, had taken mind-altering substances uh, tried to explain it in terms of Western psychology. And I think they came up in, largely against a brick wall. People were discovering that their religious traditions in many cases had dried up, that they were not getting the experience of being closer to their divine inner nature by going through the church, mosque, synagogue that they'd been brought up in. The whole human potential movement was, um, was very much uh, a factor here so that people were beginning to get interested in growth experiences. They recognized that group experiences, for example, going to workshops, going to conferences, just opened up new worlds that they hadn't explored before. So uh, there was a sense of a richness of, of human experience that uh, has, had not yet been studied, had not yet been understood in an adequate way. In the West Coast and the East Coast, we had BNs, and there was a, a youth interest in new religious ideas. Spirituality was emerging as a kind of uh, uh, primary uh, generational interest, and uh, older adults were waking up to these issues too. I think people began to see that the the evolution of consciousness was not something that stops when you reach adulthood. In fact, that may be just the beginning, and that we continue to grow throughout life and that there are tremendously many more potentials than we're usually aware of that we can unfold and it can lead to more peace, love and joy. What transpersonal psychology adds is what's traditionally been called spirit. This is the inner side, the intuitive side, the part that is longs for meaning and value, the part that was deliberately, uh, consciously left out by by mainstream psychology. The main event going on was a sense that where American psychology was wasn't where the cutting edge or the innovations were going to come. And the people who were most interested in these changes uh, basically were connected with Abraham Maslow, the psychologist who develop self-actualization theory. Transpersonal psychology is a relatively new field of, of psychology. It's been around since about 1969 when it was founded as an as a association of transpersonal psychology. Basically, is more holistic than mainstream psychology and uh, more spiritual. I was attracted to transpersonal psychology because it really addressed the whole person and it was the only branch of psychology that uh, took an interest in um, the spiritual dimensions. Uh, in those days, 30 years ago, uh, you couldn't even mention the word spirituality around psychologists because they were all trying so hard to be scientific. Jung was actually the first transpersonal psychologist. He broke with Freud over the issue of excluding the spirit from uh, psychology. And so it adds, it puts back in what had always been there in pre-modern times, which is basically the idea that human nature consists of body, mind, and spirit. The project of, of modern psychology was to uh, try to have a psychology with spirit left out. Uh, if you think of a normal bell curve of anything, normal psychology or conventional psychology tends to look at from the middle on down into the psychopathology and weirdness and uh, mental illness part. 
Now, the other half of the normal bell curve, from normal to superior to exceptional to dazzling to uh, the people who change whole cultures, which turn out to be a combination of uh, heroes, saints, uh, visionaries, I'm just as interested in that. You can say that transpersonal psychology is a system of thinking that uh, covers the whole spectrum of uh, human experience, which includes what we call uh, non-ordinary uh, states of consciousness. Now, what's, what's uh, I think, very specific for transpersonal psychology is that it not only studies these states, but they that uh, transpersonal psychologists uh, hold these states in great esteem. As transpersonal psychology has shown that these states are, uh, uh, if they're properly understood, properly supported, that they are actually healing, that they are transformative, and uh, even in a sense, uh, uh, evolutionary. What, what it was about in the beginning was publications, because uh, there were a lot of ideas around in the early 60s uh, about psychology and the culture was changing and it was the beginning of quote the 60s as we know it. Around that same time uh, people started working with consciousness expanding drugs, so called consciousness expanding drugs that basically uh, now some people use them as adjuncts to psychotherapy dealing with neurotic problems um, but other people felt uh, there's other uses that seem to go into dimensions of what ordinarily in the past would have been considered the psychology of religion. You know, William James, 1901, he wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. Religious experience. So um, Maslow and Graf and others felt they needed a new approach was needed to deal with areas beyond the normal that are not pathological <laughs> um, but touch into areas of religion, mysticism, higher states of consciousness, the kinds of things that Eastern philosophy deals with a lot. Transpersonal psychology actually arose out of uh, the living room of Anthony Sudich, who lived in Palo Alto, California. And Anthony Sudich, a very unsung hero, actually founded two out of the four major forms of psychology in the world. Transpersonal psychology attracted people who were also aware that there was something beyond what usual psychology study. We didn't really know what we were doing at the beginning, so it's almost, <laughs> I suppose you could say some kind of, uh, almost miraculous that people will gather around something which is so open-ended, so undefined at the moment. The idea that there could be an interest in consciousness, research, spiritual, uh, developmental psychology, uh, that there could be a psychology that involves the whole span of human experience and human life, and that this did not exclude things because methodologically they were hard to deal with. The idea that that could be handled uh, through a scientific, scholarly, clinically professional approach was fairly new. A lot of it had to do with Abe's friends, Tony's friends, uh, a lot of the people, Jim Fadiman brought a lot of people in, Stan Groff came in because he had had experiences he was trying to deal with in some way. He was actually recovering after a heart attack at that time. And this was very interesting. I arrived at the Maslow residence and rang the bell and his wife came to, Bertha came to answer the door. And I had this very distinct feeling of really being unwelcome. She was almost blocking uh, the entry into the house uh, with her body. But then finally, you know, stepped back and uh, Abe and I connected and had a wonderful time and uh, also Bertha and I made a good connection and we had all dinner and then uh, she told me uh, what was behind this. She said that when he read the, the manuscript uh, describing my work that he was so excited about the parallels that she was worried that if the two of us get together and start talking that it's going to be too much excitement for him that he could have another, could have another heart attack.
when the first issue of the Journal of Transpersonal was published, it was published the same month that the lunar landing occurred, where we walked on the moon for the first time. And I remember sitting in with Tony Sudic in his living room. We were watching TV with other people in the room, and here comes the message back with the video coming back from the surface of the moon. Uh, somebody has stepped on is walking on the moon. And I said to Tony, I think we both thought of it at the same time, well, it's opening up this frontier just like what we're doing with this journal. We're opening up all the way into space. Now we, now we know we can leave the planet and land somewhere else and explore. That's what we're trying to do in psychology. We're trying to open up that big edge, that edge that is so hard to get a hold of. And we're going to do it as much as possible, staying within a scientific, uh, scholarly, professional role. I became part of this. I was invited into this small group that was formulating these uh, principles of the new psychology of, Trent, of the force fourth. Uh, now, Abe, Abe and uh, Tony wanted to call this psychology transhumanistic, going even beyond uh, humanistic psychology. And then uh, they looked at uh, what I have written about uh, the experiences in psychedelic sessions, where I talk about three levels of experience, biographical, perinatal, focusing on reliving of birth and, and prenatal life, and then I described a large group of experiences or a, even a level in the unconscious uh, that I called transpersonal. And so they got very excited about this term transpersonal and moved from transhumanistic to, to transpersonal. When I look at the whole history of it, I think of it in terms of a job application, which is if you want to start two new psychologies in America that will also be effective overseas and have thousands of people involved in two organizations at least putting on conferences for hundreds and hundreds of professionals attend and it's going to generate shells and shells of professional and scholarly literature and it's going to go on for 20, 30, 40 or more years you only have one applicant to do this job and this applicant completed ninth grade only. He has a house in Palo Alto and he makes his living and supports himself uh, as a psychologist, a counselor, but he never got a degree and in addition to not having anything beyond a ninth grade education, he can't get up and walk, he can't take a book off the shelf because he is lying on his back and has been on his back for decades because he was disabled by a severe case of juvenile arthritis before any effective medications were available. Well, you have to fill in the spots on the application that ordinarily wouldn't be there. Number one is he read everything he could get his hands on, remembered most of it, and was constantly integrating it. The second thing that's interesting about this guy is he had a terrific mind. He not only read, but he knew what to do with it all. And uh, I'm going to tell a story out of class here. He was a labor agitator in the Depression. He was the guy who made the plans and sent them out to other people. Now, in the Depression, there was a lot of labor difficulty and violence and a lot of people were in deep trouble because of the depression. But nobody thought that a guy lying on his back who was totally disabled in a little house in Palo Alto could possibly have anything to do with this. He couldn't move his legs, couldn't blow his own nose, couldn't feed himself and was on this gurney and I used to turn the pages of the papers that we would get in and Tony told me Sonia, in the condition I'm in, the only kind of play I can do is intellectual play. And that's what we did every afternoon for three or four hours for probably four years. And in the beginning, Abe joined us. So we were there when we were doing all this thing about what kind of uh, statements we would make about transpersonal psychology. And it was Tony and Abe who actually sent me over to the Zendo.
which was nearby my home, only a 10-minute drive from my home, because they were interested in what Asian psychologists had to say about the farther reaches of human development. Transpersonal really began as much in the living room of Tony Sudic as any place on earth. And each week we would have a, like a salon and somebody amazing would come through, lured by this, who was this amazing man in the slant bed, and we would hang out with them and they would in a sense uh, really teach us. These were uh, gurus that passed through and major researchers and so forth. And gradually, the journal began to emerge. And out of the journal, there be we realized that you don't run a journal when you're really a poor little group. You have an association. And the purpose of the association is to charge a number of people more than you could charge them for the journal. Culturally, the transpersonal movement can really be traced in the West, all the way back to the Eleusinian mysteries. Transpersonal psychology uh, is really a, uh, in its contemporary form, a reaction to the reliance on uh, the mundane, everyday state of consciousness, which we need to function in our everyday lives. We need it when we're driving through traffic. Uh, we need it when our pay we're paying our bills and just kind of uh, making ordinary plans and so on. But it's not the best state of consciousness for deepening our connection to a uh, uh, sense of some larger meaning in the universe, uh, a sense of connection to a higher power, uh, other things that are very important historically to human existence. So the Eleusinian Mysteries were a ritual that uh, was part of the uh, life in Greece for around 500 years. And people were limited to participating in this a single time in their entire life. It was a four-day ritual. Uh, the best historical evidence is that it included ingesting an LSD-like substance. Uh, and people were forbidden to talk about what they had experienced during this ritual under the penalty of death. So historians like Eugene Taylor really trace the cultural origins of transpersonal psychology back to this movement and then throughout history to movements, for example, in the United States uh, that included uh, people meditating in caves in Pennsylvania during the 1700s. Uh, America became truly a spiritual democracy where uh, splinter groups from all over Europe could come and live in their kind of spiritual communes and live lives that they could not live in Europe where the dominant powers, whether it was the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, uh, insisted that people worship uh, in the way that the church mandated. So America has always been a kind of experiment in spiritual democracy. Now in the 1800s, the transcendentalists uh, began to incorporate many of the practices that were just becoming uh, known in the West. Uh, practices from India and Tibet and so on. Those practices were really only known to a very small group of people in the West. There certainly were publications on them, and the kind of literati knew about them, uh, and there were small groups who practiced them. It was really in the 1960s, through books like uh, uh, Alan Watts' book on uh, Zen and Enlightenment, um, through the Maharishi packaging meditation in a form where people could uh, readily learn the practice, um, also through the widespread use of psychedelic drugs where people would spontaneously have these kinds of experiences. So that's what really created the kind of cultural opening to these uh, transpersonal experiences. Again, I want to distinguish between transpersonal experiences and transpersonal psychology. 
because it was really transpersonal psychology that then came in and said, these are really important experiences for us as psychologists to study and to understand. I was working at the um, Department of Psychiatry of the School of Medicine in Prague, and um, we just were finishing a large study of malaria, one of the early tranquilizers. And one day, the department when I was working got a large uh, box of ampules from Sandoz, and a letter came with it. And uh, the letter said this was a very exciting investigational new substance that was discovered, or the, the effects of which were discovered practically by accident by Dr. Hoffman, the, the leading chemist in the laboratories. It's called LSD-25, so I wouldn't have missed this for anything in the world. I kind of, you know, became one of the early volunteers, and I had an experience that just really changed my life, both professionally and personally. Uh, the man who was my preceptor, who got the supply, uh, was very interested in electroencephalography, so everybody who wanted a session had to have EEG before, during, and after. Now, what this meant practically is that uh, between the second and the third hour when the session culminates, my experience culminated, uh, this research assistant came and said this was time for driving the brain waves. So she took me to this little cell. I lay down, she pasted the electrodes on my head and asked me to close my eyes then bring this, brought this gigantic uh, stroboscopic light, put it above my head and then turn this thing on. And in the next moment, there was light like I had never seen in my life, couldn't even imagine existed. I read later sort of some of the descriptions of, of the mystics. They talk about, you know, millions of suns and so on. Um, that was what happened to me. Um, and uh, the only context I had for understanding or relating to it was I, I thought, this is what, must have, what it must have been like in Hiroshima when the bomb went off. Uh, today, I think it was more like the Dharmakaya, like the primary clear light from the Tibetan Book of the Dead that supposedly appears at the time when we die. Now, what happened experientially is that my consciousness was catapulted out of my body, as separated from my body. I lost the research assistant, I lost the clinic, I lost Prague, I lost the planet, and uh, suddenly I was in a state where my consciousness had no boundaries. I had the feeling I became the universe. And um, there were a lot of processes happening for which at the time I had no names, but later what kind of, I was vaguely able to relate to uh, concepts like Big Bang, uh, you know, black holes, white holes. Uh, when I was reading that, that seemed to be like related to what happened in that session. And it was just absolutely clear to me that the consci consciousness is not a product of the brain, that those are two separate entities, you know, it's like a driver and the car. So um, I was very impressed. And I felt, you know, since I'm stuck in psychiatry, by far the most interesting thing I can do in my life or with my life is to study these states. So it's going to be soon... Uh, um, half a century when I had this experience and since that time I had really I have really done very little uh, professionally that would not be related in one way or another to these non-ordinary states. You know I use this model of the altered state, the set and setting, you have to look at the set and setting to, to, to find out what the content of the experience is. That's true of dreams too. It's true right now in a waking state, you know, we have a certain intention, we have a certain setting, that's what else is there? It's the inner and the outer, right? Uh, and similarly with substances like LSD, you had an external catalyst that pretty reliably, you know, given the appropriate set and setting, could induce mystical or religious experiences that were otherwise completely unusual. In fact, there was a study done at Harvard by a person called Walter Pankey, who was an MD and a, getting his PhD in the history of religion. And, he took the idea of set and setting seriously and said, let's, let's pick out a group of people who are interested in religious experience, like theology students at a seminary. And let's pick a setting, you know, where uh, during a, in a chapel, during a service, a Good Friday service in a chapel separate from the main chapel, 
and let's tell them we're interested in inducing, you know, a religious experience, and we give them the double-blind placebo-controlled study, like you do with strict psychopharmacology, where uh, where half the group got placebo and half the group got psilocybin, and then he had a list of criteria from the mystical mysticism literature, or, and on all of the criteria, uh, the group that got psilocybin uh, reported significantly higher incidences, you know, including like certain knowledge and ineffability, paradoxicality, transcendence of time and space. Uh, only one criteria there was no difference, and that was like a general feeling of love. You know, whether people going to church on Good Friday, they had a general feeling of love also, whether they took something or not. So, uh, And that changed later on, follow-up studies six months later, and somebody did a follow-up study 25 years later with some of these people. And they remembered the experience, and they still interpreted the same way. The International Foundation for Advanced Study had a what was called an investigational drug license. And we had told the federal government that we were working with people in a therapeutic environment. And they came and checked us out now and then. And the Food and Drug Administration cops came and checked our material. Uh, we used to, in a sense, put aside Wednesdays for someone to come and surprise us with a, a visit for some government agency. So we were highly observed. And this was at Stanford? This was not at Stanford. Stanford wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Stanford was terrified at becoming the Harvard of the West, and I was the most likely person to do it to them. We were working on this, this uh, working with materials at a very low dose of, of psychedelics for intellectual problems with senior scientists and the way in which that day would run with them, the experimental day, was they would come in and they would get stereo headphones and they would be lying on a, on a couch uh, with a black eye shade and listening to classical music. Um, and then around noon we would take off the eye shades and offer them a little bit of food, mostly turned down, and say basically get to work. And out of that came a number of patents, a number of breakthrough kind of inventions, um, very good stuff. And while we were doing that, in the midst of about halfway through the number of people we felt we were going to run as a research project, we got a letter from the federal government. And it said, um, if you have opened this letter, we have just closed down your research project. Meaning your investigational drug license to do research in this area has been terminated as of the receipt of this letter. And I recall, because we were, we were sitting in a little room next to our session room, we had four people lying there, major scientists, most of them now referred by other people who had been our scientists, um, listening to the later Beethoven quartets. And I looked around as the youngest member of this group and said, I think we got this letter tomorrow. <laughs> And we all acknowledge that that probably was a good idea. It was too much for some people, okay? Some people had difficulty handling the experiences, or they used them the wrong way, or they got distracted by the, the pleasure of it instead of learning from it. But other people saw we could all be mystics of a sort. We could all have a direct feeling for the transpersonal, the spiritual, and begin to base our lives on that. And that revolutionized our whole culture, and in ways we're still just beginning to find out. Let me give you a personal example. When I was in graduate school, one of the psychiatrists in the psychology department where I was training was doing LSD research. And I was a subject for him a number of times in between taking exams and going to classes and all that. I had marvelous insights into the nature of the human mind that way. Things which were abstract ideas, like dissociation. You know, intellectually I knew all about dissociation, but it wasn't until I'd had a psychedelic experience that involved a lot of dissociation that I suddenly at a deep level understood, oh, that's what that stuff is, and that's how it worked. It gave me a lot of understandings of the way the human mind works, which have gradually come out in a more formal kind of way in my own research over the years. So for most of my work in altered states of consciousness, for instance, I've tried to experience at least something of particular states so I have an inside idea of what it's about.
you don't have an inside idea, you can do awfully silly things. If you took a behaviorist approach to psychedelic drugs like LSD, for instance, you would probably say that most of the time they act like a sedative or a tranquilizer because people sit still and don't do anything for a long time. And that's not what's happening. <laughs> and William James, so, and he, he studied parapsychological experiments. Somnambulism, hypnotism, all kinds of unusual experiences. He studied psychedelic experiences. He took nitrous oxide. And he said, he said, no, he said, he had an amazing quotation. He said, all around our ordinary consciousness, separated by the filmiest of screens, lie other realms of reality. And no account of human consciousness that leaves these other realms out of account can be considered complete. And we ourselves had a large study using. Uh, LSD uh, therapy with uh, terminal cancer patients, seeing if we can influence somehow uh, the attitude towards death and transform the, the process of dying through mystical experiences. This was probably the most interesting, the most moving uh, work that I've ever been involved in. Results would be that a significant uh, number of uh, the patients were, were rated as significantly improved in a variety of of areas, uh, you know, subjective experiences, uh, um, all the way to uh, how easy it was to manage, manage them, and so on. Uh, the influence on pain. Um, there was about one third of the patients who were seen as essentially, I would say, about one third dramatically improved, one third sort of moderate improvements, and then there was one third when there were no major changes that we could detect. It was in, uh, in uh, three areas, uh, generally, we saw great uh, changes emotionally, you know, in terms of depression, uh, uh, tension, uh, insomnia, things of that kind. We saw also very specific uh, changes in the attitude towards death. They s developed a very convincing feeling that if they die, it's the body that dies, uh, you know, that it's not they who die. Uh, so it seemed to have transformed also the experience of dying itself in those patients whom we could follow in the process of death. And then the third area was we found out that uh, LSD had very powerful influence in many patients on uh, pain. Sometimes even pain that was not tractable by, by narcotics. Of uh, course the propaganda came, you know, when the image of LSD suddenly was dictated by, by journalists and uh, the criterion was what happened to people when they take it in the street rather than what you do when you, you know, run a responsible therapeutic experiment and so on. That was one part of it. The other part was that uh, in these situations the administrators and the legislators didn't want to take the responsibility. You know, uh, they were afraid of malpractice suits which are very, very um, common in, in this country. And we got a very strange answer when we, when we asked for more, more money for the research. They said, you have already proved that, you know, it's useful. There's no reason to research it any further. That was their, that was their response. So we were taking the risks. Uh, for instance, when I graduated from Stanford, you know, uh, vanilla A educational institution, but my dissertation was on the effective use of psychedelics and psychotherapy, it was clear that I was not only an incredibly innovative researcher on a cutting-edge field, but nobody wanted to give me a job. I, I think the, the kind of person who feels that well this this world of uh, getting up in the morning and and uh, and getting into the freeways and and uh, to work and hurrying and and trying to accomplish uh, and getting only half of it done every day and then coming home at night uh, at night and going to bed and go and getting up the next morning and doing the same routine that the, that that's not quite I enough that that there's got to be more to the meaning of our lives. The, the people that are drawn into the field, and the, uh, both faculty and students, and staff, people who work as secretaries and clerks and registrars, um, are often uh, 
themselves on a spiritual path. They're asking good questions about their lives and um, often care deeply about how things uh, work in the world and uh, how to be kinder. I think in a very basic way, people drawn to transpersonal psychology are very likely to be people who even from childhood did not think that things are simply the way they appear. People that have seen beyond ordinary appearance into the complexity of human experience. For whatever reason, there's a lot of different reasons that a person, person's perspective on life can shift. It could be simply through your upbringing. It could be through an illness. Um, it could be through a traumatic event. It could be by virtue of being gifted in some way that sets you apart, but some, some way of seeing that things are beyond their mere appearance. I, I'm speaking in the, trying to be the, in the simplest sense of what, what's this impetus in people to go beyond, to go beyond the ordinary, go beyond the, the merely go beyond consensus reality. The fact that we have all these different religious traditions in the world and we're all bumping up against each other raises questions. It's like, what if I'd been born over there? You know, when I'm born here, this is the truth, you know? Well, what, what if I was born over there? Would that be the truth? And, you know, one response to that is to throw it out and say, well, it's all baloney. Another response is to go really into your tradition and say, we're right and you guys are all wrong. Uh, but for the people that can't do either one of those, who go, you know what, I've had experiences where there's really something going on, there's something bigger than me, I know that. But it doesn't make sense to me to put it in a little box and say, I'm right and all you guys are wrong. I think that's the kind of person that goes to transpersonal psychology and says, I want to understand this. I need to have a bigger picture. I need to reinvent. I need to be part of the process of reinventing the understanding of who we are and how we relate to this something that's bigger than we are. I think I'm one of those many people that primarily was drawn to it as a kind of lifeboat in academia because I was in graduate school, interested in shamanism, in my case, and there was simply no way to fit it into my program. And the, the area that most allowed me to be able to talk about shamanism with my professors was transpersonal psychology. Psychology of Buddhism and the meditation practices, the, for example, uh, Siddha Yoga or Sufi practices, uh, um, Buddhist meditation in all its forms, whether it's Zen or Vipassana or Tibetan Buddhism, were all becoming increasingly popular. And it was only transpersonal psychology that really um, made any effort to understand uh, what was happening when people did take their meditation practice seriously. When I brought out my Altered States of Consciousness book back in 1969, I had a section on meditation, and I bragged in the introduction to that section that I was reprinting two-thirds of the English language scientific literature on meditation, which sounded very impressive to you realize it was two of the three articles that existed. <laughs> There was almost no scientific research on meditation. Then, years later in the 70s, there was an article published in Science that found some physiological correlates of transcendental meditation. And all of a sudden, that legitimatized it for mainstream science. If it affected the brain and the body, maybe meditation is real instead of some weird thing that comes from the East. So it legitimatized research, and now there's more than probably 1,400, 1,500 scientific studies on meditation published. 
meditative practice um, is a practice that, uh, generally speaking, attempts to uh, either uh, pacify or modulate the mental processes so that they become more permeable to uh, the light of consciousness, to the energy of consciousness, they become more porous to it, so that uh, the mind uh, relaxes, and then when the mind relaxes, uh, naturally becomes more permeable or porous to that kind of like um, uh, greater knowledge, greater consciousness, and then there is uh, more chances of a descent or an ascent, no? I think one of the best things for therapists in training is to learn to meditate because it does quiet the mind and give one a capacity for listening more deeply to oneself and others. And I think that when somebody is in therapy and they also have a meditation practice, it's as though the process goes along much faster because when you sit down to meditate, all sorts of things come up and then it's all grist for the mill for the psychotherapy process. I find that uh, people who are meditators tend to make much more rapid progress in therapy and, uh, and I think that there's just a, a real asset. However, I don't think one is a substitute for the other. I do think that one of the, uh, the splits that exists in our culture that hopefully will be healed is that often meditation teachers uh, do not think that therapy is valuable and sometimes there are some therapists that don't think meditation is valuable. One of transpersonal psychology's big jobs that's going to take many years to do is to classify the different kinds of meditation practices and to find out what kind works for what kind of person. So that eventually someday we might be able to say for your personality type, don't do Zen meditation because too many people go off the deep end with it and not enough people feel they've spiritually grown. But this other kind of meditation is good for your personality type. We don't know anywhere near enough to be able to make those kind of recommendations at this point. But that's my hope for the future of our field. I think it's hard to describe. I think it's hard to describe in the same way that, how would you describe the experience of waking up in the morning? It's as though when you're in a dream, you think it's, that's reality. It's the way it is. Then all of a sudden, you wake up and you discover that it was only a dream. But you see, when you wake up from sleep, uh, you awaken to what you then take to be real. And I kind of like to think of the, the spiritual awakening as simply awakening, rather than moving from one kind of spellboundness to another, you just awaken. And I think that's what happens in our, in our lives, that we at some point begin to recognize that all of the past and all of the future exist only in the mind and that our reality is in this present moment and that a spiritual awakening allows us to see how much of our lives is spent in dreaming. Most of our time is spent thinking about the past or the future and that takes away from our capacity to live fully in the present. In simple terms, uh, I would describe it probably in two directions. One direction would be like a process of uh, gradual uh, letting go of uh, our narcissism and self-centeredness at all levels, not only conscious but also physical and emotional and, and sexual, uh, and, uh, and in all its forms, the more gross, the more obvious and the more subtle. And uh, that's, uh, and that I would say, is pretty never-ending. <laughs> and then the other direction would be like as a process of uh, of uh, becoming more complete human beings. And by complete human being, I mean something very simple. I mean like a human being that is fully grounded in this reality, fully here on planet Earth, without needing to go anywhere else to be full and complete and free, <laughs> but at the same time open uh, to all those energies of consciousness here and open to all those energies of life uh, from this plane. No? Inevitably, 
when a person has a spiritual awakening, it's intensely personal, intensely personal. But also inevitably, if one is going to evolve in it and um, find ways to live here, uh, one begins to see that others have had this experience and that traditions have evolved around people having the same basic experience. And then you have to ask yourself, what do I fit in best with or do I fit in any of them and what do I want to um, incorporate for, for myself as a way to live in this world? Because it is going to ha have to end up in relationship. You know, we, we have spiritual awakenings, but we don't have them in isolation. Um, we affect others by our spiritual awakening and they affect us as well. The Tibetan Buddhists like to talk about Hedwa, some terrible shock. You stand there in front of the Twin Towers, and suddenly you might feel a lot lighter. I mean, it's horrible, but there's an opening and a new mind state can come in. I, I do think awakening is about your mind state, and um, it's about presence, immediacy, all at once. You know, how do you take in the all, stop guarding against the all, have a kind of all at once-ness. All right, that's the awakening. And then can you stabilize it? Or do you lose it and forget it? The spiritual awakening for me is experienced most deeply in my physical body. And in that sense, I'm probably different than a lot of people. Uh, but perhaps more like a lot of lay people who don't, wouldn't call themselves transpersonal psychologists. I think a lot of people, for instance, who uh, do uh, love fly fishing or fishing or sports, go in the zone, as it's often called. And those experiences are, base, are, are, are basically spiritual in my, in my understanding and uh, allow for a kind of at-oneness with one's environment and one's activity which is very physical as well as spiritual. And from my perspective, um, I can actually feel those changes in my body. My body becomes more light-filled, literally, or more porous. Spiritual de development, in many ways, is about creating spaciousness. It's about creating space. And even the field might be described as a field which creates space. It creates spaciousness, capacity rather than to think about it as a field with a fixed definition. Well, I think the main asset that a transpersonal psychologist brings to the practice of psychotherapy is an openness to the many dimensions of experience that transcend ordinary rationality so that uh, while uh, cognitive psychology works with beliefs, it's very much grounded in the rational. And there are certain experiences which are not rational and yet are very significant for people. And I think it's important to recognize that non-rational experiences uh, aren't necessarily pre-rational, that some of them are trans-rational. But it doesn't mean that all non-rational experiences are trans-rational. Some of them are pre-rational. Some of them really are regressive, and that may or may not be regression in service of the ego.